All right. So this video, I just wanted to jump in real fast today and talk about the GCS score, right? The Glasgow Coma Scale, and really why I think it's such a helpful, beneficial thing for obviously patient assessments and the reason why we do it in the first place, but really why I think it's a good idea for national registry testing, right? Or in-class testing or any aspect like that. Uh, I mean, the reality is there's a lot of stress and anxiety in taking the national registry test. And the more you can kind of set yourself up for success by guaranteeing that you get some answers right, uh, the way better off you're going to be, right? Whether you get, you know, 80 questions or 130 questions, right? That's a lot of kind of stress roller coaster ride that you're taking on over the course of the program. So, or the course of the test, right? So with your GCS score, right, that's one of them that, you know, it really, I can't encourage it enough, just buckle down and memorize these 15 little options. And we're gonna walk through them and understand, you know, what's going on with each of them so that you'll be able to identify them uh, with a patient that you see, but also then be able to identify them with uh, uh, a national registry style test question, right? Because this is type of one that, you know, when you're getting question after question after question on your test, you should, if you get a GCS score, like your brain should light up with excitement, right? If you just memorize the, sta the table, right? Because the more, like I said, the more you can guarantee you get a couple questions, right? The more helpful it is with that kind of motivation and testing stamina and really that kind of stress level as the test progresses, right? When you're unsure about a question and then you take a next question, you're maybe feel all right about that one. And then you're a little bit uncomfortable with the next question. And then you have absolutely no idea on the next one, right? It, this, it just creates this, you know, negative, you know, stress loop that's happening. And by the end of the test, you can't see, you know, left from right or up from down. And it's just all over the place and it doesn't work out for anybody. So if you can, you know, see a test question and maybe you feel all right about it. See another test question. You think you got that one well. See another test question. You've got no idea. And then see a GCS score and you know you memorize that table and you're like, bam, I got this one right at least. Right? It helps with that motivation. It helps with that energy. It helps with that uh, stress management over the course of the test. So GCS, again, I, I love it uh, from the testing standpoint of being able to help guarantee that you got a little bit of some positive feelings during that test. So let's get through it, right? So we've got our four categories, right? We've got the eye opening, the verbal response, and the motor response for how our patient is responding to different stimuli, right? So on the eye opening side, right, the maximum score, right, we can see is four, right? Bottom score for each of the categories is one, right? So the worst score possible across your total GCS you can get is three, right? One, one, and one. And the best score possible is 15, four, five, and six, right? It's a helpful one to remember, certainly when you're doing the comparison difference with like the APGAR score, where the bottom rating on an APGAR score is zero across the five categories. So zero is the lowest score possible. And the top rating is two, so the highest score possible is 10, right? So uh, GCS score, uh, APGAR, and rule of nines all fall into those registry style questions that I was saying that are really uh, just going to be that, you know, confidence building question if you memorized the test questions, right? Or if you memorize the tables, not the test questions. So with eye opening, right, your eyes are open spontaneous or they open to verbal stimuli, pain pressure, or no response. This one, I've always looked at it and it really falls into our classic AVPU kind of initial starting point for a mental status assessment where we say our patient is alert or they respond to verbal, or they respond to some sort of pain, or they're unresponsive, right? If you put that in relationship to what the eyes are doing, it fits, right? Their eyes are alert, open spontaneously. Their eyes open up in response to a verbal stimulus. They open up in response to some sort of pain or pressure stimulus, or they don't open at all. They're fully unresponsive. Right, so I've always liked that AVPU because we've memorized that one already for other patient assessment stuff. So we can just remember that that one is the four, three, two, and one for our eye opening. Right. Now I put in here pain or pressure, right? Pretty much everybody has always learned it's pain. And there's been a little bit of, of some stuff out there that have really kind of started to shift us to say, maybe we should be using a pressure stimulus 
as opposed to the idea that we're intentionally causing our patient pain, right? It's a little bit of just some terminology, right? It's really still the same thing, whether it's a pinch of the trap uh, or a pinch of the tricep muscle, right? It's that pressure stimulus kind of hurts, right? Elicits a bit of a pain response, uh, but a lot of places are starting to use pressure in there as well. So their eyes open in response to some sort of pain or pressure is that too. Right? Now, verbal response is one that I've seen, uh, you know, verbal and some of the motor ones are a little bit more um, confusing uh, sometimes for students. And you really have to look at it and remember the idea that each step down on the scale is a slight degradation of mental status, right? They're in a little bit worse shape and a little bit worse shape and a little bit worse shape, right? So the top one, right, for a score of five, oriented and converses is really the old A and O times four, right? The person plays time and event questions, right? They're answering everything appropriately, interacting with you just fine, makes perfect sense, right? Now four says disoriented and converses, or some books may phrase it converses and confused. Um, but there's some sort of confusion, some sort of disorientation. They're still talking to you. They're still interacting with you. There's just some confusion that's going on there. Uh, the third one is inappropriate words um, or sometimes nonsensical language or nonsensical speaking. Right. That one is the one that, you know, I've seen more people struggle with between is it a four or is it three, right? Disoriented, confused, inappropriate words, really, what's the difference? Okay. And so the difference is when you're asking your patient questions, does their response, does their answer at least fit into the category of what it is that you're asking? Okay. So if you ask your, your patient, um, you know, what year is it, right? And the year is 2020, and they say the year is 2000, right? They provided you with an answer that was a year. It was correct in the category, but it was an incorrect response. There's disorientation, there is confusion, right? That would get a four, right? Is you asked what year is it, and they provided you a year, but it's the wrong year. That's a four. Now, slightly worse mental status than that is, I'm gonna be silly for a second. If you ask them, hey, what year is it? And they look at you and say, purple. Okay, they answered you, right? But their answer was not in the category whatsoever, right? It's that slight difference of them saying purple in response to the question, what year is it? As opposed to, 2000 in response to what year is it, right? One answer is in the correct category. It's just a wrong answer. That's disoriented and converses. And one of them, they provided you an answer, but it's not in relationship to the question that you asked whatsoever. And that would be that inappropriate words or nonsensical language. Next step down is incomprehensible sounds. So you're asking your patient questions, you're interacting with them, and they're you know moaning and groaning. They're making sounds as if their brain is trying to answer, but it's not answering in a coordinated fashion where language is actually coming out. They're just making sounds. Uh, and then the worst case is always no response whatsoever. So you're talking to them, you're interacting with them, nothing. They're not providing any sort of uh, verbal response of any kind, not even the sounds, right? Absolutely nothing. All right, and then motor response, uh, best score is the six, and that's follows commands. And that's the one that, uh, you know, if you say, hey, I need to take a blood pressure on your arm, and they hold out their arm, right? They're following commands, right? They're interacting with you. Or if you're doing grips, pushes, pulls, anything like that, checking that circulation motor sensory response, right? They're following commands. They're pushing against you, right? If they have the ability to. So beyond that, the next step down is what we call localizes pain. And localizes pain versus withdraws to pain is another one that's a very subtle difference that I've seen a lot of students kind of struggle with, right? And if you're thinking about it with mental status, it's which one is more active and which one is more passive, right? 
the more active response is a better mental status than a more passive response. Okay? So it localizes pain, right? Maybe that's, you know, you pinch that trap muscle and the patient tries to push your hands away, right? They're actively trying to remove that stimulus, right? Remove that painful stimulus, right? Or, you know, people used to do the sternal rub, right? They tell us not to do that anymore, right? They used to do the sternal rub. If that patient tried to make that stimulus stop, right? They actively tried to make it stop by pushing you away, right? That localizes pain. Withdrawals to pain, if we took that same, right, pinch of the trapezius, you know, painful uh, stimulus, and they just turn away, right? Slightly worse, right? One's actively trying to get you to stop, pushing you away, and the other one is you just kind of pulling away, the patient pulling away, right? So localizes pain is they know where that painful stimulus is and they're trying to make it stop, right? Withdrawals from pain, they know where that painful stimulus is, but their body's response is to just try to flee away, right? Fighting it off versus fleeing away, right? That's that slight step down to withdrawals from pain or withdrawals to pain. Now, third is abnormal flexion or decorticate posturing. Right? And maybe with that stimulus, uh, the abnormal flexion is the muscles are flexed in, right? So the flexion is they're flexed, right? Like if you flex your arms, right? They're flexed in. Same thing with their legs. They're kind of pointed and flexed inward, right? Uh, the other way, if it's not abnormal flexion, they'll say decorticate posturing. And decorticate, think they're flexing to the core, right? Decorticate is flexing. Decorticate is flexing to the core, right? Abnormal extension, instead of flexing to the core, they're extending out. Right, those arms are extended out, right? So that's abnormal extension or uh, the decerebrate posturing, decerebrate posturing. Now, both of those, that issue is high up that brainstem, right? The corticate posturing is, there's some stuff happening high up on the brainstem. Decerebrate posturing, even higher up the brainstem, right? We're now getting down to the core inside of the brain, right? So both of those are bad. The cerebrate is even worse than decorticate. Both of those issues are very high up uh, that brainstem. Okay? So decorticate flexing to the core. The cerebrate is the extension, right? Everything flexing or extending out. Okay? Uh, and then uh, no response is obviously going to be it, right? Whether it's the sternal rub, trap pinch, anything like that. Uh, there's just no muscle movement, motor control whatsoever. Right? So that one's obviously going to be uh, fully unresponsive or just no response for that uh, particular stimulus right, for what we're looking at. Okay. So this is really kind of the rough kind of quick layout of that GCS score. And uh, again, you know, the more you can kind of understand that slipping, you know, mental status of which one is a little bit worse than which one, it'll help you. But again, kind of circling back to my point at the beginning, look at things like the GCS and APGAR and rule of nines. Okay? Some of those ones should just be anchored in rock solid knowledge so that you have a confidence boosting question as opposed to getting that GCS score and going, ah, oh, crap, I never memorized the GCS table. Okay? Now it's just one more question causing stress on top of the rest of everything else. Right? So always look at how can we improve that positive emotion as we're taking that test to get past the rest of the stress of those tests, right? So GCS, APGAR, rule of nines, uh, CPR ratios, uh, ventilation ratios, just some of those things, just really etch them in stone in your brain to make sure you've got them. And it could be that little bit of a difference that can be the difference between managing your stress and passing the national registry test and letting stress get a hold of you and struggling to pass that test. So take it for what you will, but I hope you uh, enjoyed this little one and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.